before I hand over the microphone to Ali, I will need to share the screen. And come on. Yeah, show me over. Sorry about this. Okay. This is uh hepiniz bunu biliyorsunuz. This is the uh Turkish personal data sharing law. Now all the participants here are consenting to be recorded and later have this recording on YouTube and on our website and etc. and which might be shared further later on. So uh, if you don't wish to have your name or your video on the recording, you can change your name or close close your curtain or that is stop your video but we rather you don't do any of them okay so much for this and the recording is just started already okay uh i remote to the stage is yours uh thank you very much jam abi i would like to share a, a screen uh which is here okay Okay, here. Uh, dear friends, very welcome to the 73rd Zumbalaki meeting. Uh, our topic of today is the UBI debate and the UBI movement. Uh, we have two distinguished guests, uh, Professor Dr. Carl Whitquist from United States and Alexander Dero from Netherlands. As usual, our host is uh, Jan Baisal and technical support is given by our dear friend Mehmet Özel. I will try to moderate the session. Uh, you already received uh, CVs of our guests, uh, Professor Dr. Carl Weidegrist and uh, Alexander Dero. <clears throat> Carl Weidegrist is an American political philosopher and economist, and uh, he has published uh, in different fields, uh, economics, politics, philosophy, and anthropology. He is the co-founder of the United States Basic Income Guarantee Network, which is a very strong network. And uh, he has been serving as a co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network, BN, uh, between 2008 and 2017. The full document is in your emails. Uh, our other guest, our other distinguished guest, Alexander Dero, he is a Dutch politician. Uh, he was active in 1970s uh, in the anti-nuclear energy movement. And uh, he is coming from the Pacifist uh, Socialist Party. Uh, but he's uh, one of the co-founders of the BN. In fact, any, a, another co-founder, uh, our dear friend Annie Miller, is also with us today. Uh, but uh, Alexander Dero was uh, one of the co-founders in 1986. Uh, at that time, the name of the network was Basic Income European Network. Later on, it uh, changed to Basic Income Earth Network, but BN uh, remained the same. And now he's the chair of the Basic Income Association in Netherlands. And he's also co-founders, uh, one of the co-founders of the political party Greens in Netherlands. And also one last thing I would like to mention that he was a member of the European Parliament between the years 1999 and 2004. Uh, we will have two rounds and we are targeting to allocate 15 minutes to each uh, uh, guest uh, in each round. Uh, in the first round, uh, dear Carl will talk about the UBI debate in general, uh, the soul and characteristics of UBI history of UBI discussions, current research topics, etc. Uh, following his contribution, Alexander uh, will talk about the UBI movement. Uh, it will include the history of UBI activism, BN's foundation for UBI activism in the world, especially in the political arena, relationships and cooperation with other movements like women, green, human rights, the growth movements, etc. And of course, uh, synergy creation possibilities. This will be the completion of the first round. At the end of the first round, if you do have any written questions, we will be able to forward these questions to our guests. Uh, but afterwards, we will have the second round. Again, each uh, guest will use about 15 minutes uh, during the second round. So Carl will talk about the cost of basic income, back of the envelope calculations. Uh, he will tell about the cost of UBI, 
and how numerical calculations are meaningful, how meaningful they are, and the real touch or loads and contributions of UBI to the society. And uh, as a second speaker of the second round, Alexander will talk about the current status of UBI discussions in the political arena, uh, the four UBI networks, activism, academics, interest, media attention, political parties and their programs, recent elections, uh, expectations from the future, etc. So it will be uh, mostly regarding the political arena. So we have two rounds uh, and we can start uh, with dear Carl uh, to the second round. Uh, dear Carl, the word is yours. Uh, please unmute yourself. Okay, you are already unmuted. Okay, word is yours, Carl. All right. Thank you, Ali. So, uh, Ali asked me to talk first about the soul and characteristics of UBI. The soul of UBI, I believe, is that it's wrong for anyone to come between anyone else and the resources they need to survive. And that's exactly what we, what we do. We try to characterize it as if, oh, people who don't have money, uh, they're poor people, uh, they, they, uh, it's, they just happen to be poor. And if we give them something, we are being nice and kind to them, but we didn't cause it. But that's just simply not the reality. The reality is poverty is having a lack of access to resources to survive. It, it, is, it is being in a situation where you need resources to survive and those resources are owned by someone else and you don't have enough money to buy them. That's what poverty is. There are many, there are many societies that have no poverty whatsoever. They might not live well, they might not have access to all the commerce we do, we do but people with direct access to resources are not poor the way people in our society are that are. And we say, well, you, all you have to do is work to get resources, but you work for someone else, someone with more privileges to you do. And if you are desperate to get resources because you start out in a default, default position of being poor, you will work much cheaper for them than you otherwise would. You are essentially an unfree person. So we create poverty, we put people into poverty and we take advantage of that by uh, by using that as leverage to pay very poor wages. We are the only animal, we are the only animal that is dependent on the owner of resources to survive. All animals are dependent on nature to survive, but only human beings are dependent on the owners of nature. And the owners of nature are not likewise dependent on the rest of us. They can live off their assets and never do any work for anyone else for the rest of their life if they own enough. So we have a system that not only creates equality and takes advantage of equality, but it's highly unequal in the responsibilities that it outlines for people. This idea and many others, just the idea that we shouldn't have poverty, the idea that we shouldn't be holding people to some responsibility to get out of poverty when we just created it for them, uh, these are ideas that have been around at least since Thomas Paine, when he argued for basic income or something very much like it in the 1790s in his pamphlet, Agrarian Justice. And it was in response to that pamphlet that another pamphleteer of the 1790s, Thomas Spence, outlined the first thing we know of as basic income, which is an unconditional payment going to every single person enough to meet their needs for their entire lives, whether they work or not. The idea has come and gone in philosophy and economics since then. In 1916, Bertrand Russell, without using the term, talked about a certain small income sufficient for necessaries that would go to everyone regardless of their work or not. And then a larger income would go to people who engage in some work that they, that the community recognizes is useful. On this basis, we may build further, he said. So basic income is not the end of social justice. It's not all there is to social justice, but it is a central 
basis of social justice. You cannot have a just and free and equal society if you're threatening some people with poverty if they don't go get jobs and take orders from people all day. Now that debate has, there's been, of course, pushback from that debate. Uh, one argument is that supposedly people who don't know, do no work, people who do no work are um, living off the work of other people. And they say, well, then everyone has to contribute, so your contribution should be equal for uh, everyone should make a contribution. It's been many arguments, and you're a parasite, or you're a parasite, or an exploiter, um, or, a, or, or a free rider, if you, uh, if you don't take part in what should be considered a joint project for everyone's benefit. Problem with that argument is that we don't enter into this project equally. As I've said, some people don't have to work and others do. So the responsibility to work is uneven. And if you have some way, if you have some reform where there will be no rich people who are too rich to work, I want to hear it. I doubt it's going to work very well. Um, I, that you can ever have one where, no one, where, where, where every single person works. But also the work that we hold people to do is very unequal. Some people get to fulfill their work requirement by being supermodels. And having their picture taken for just standing there and having their picture taken for millions of dollars. Well, people can take their picture of me for millions of dollars. I'll be glad to take that. Okay. I'll take that over basic income anytime, but not everybody's allowed that. Some people get all these highly nice privilege jobs and other people, they don't get anything in this unless they do the worst, lowest paid, most unpleasant jobs. And most of these jobs are not about something that we could plausibly have a duty to do. Most of our economic activity is creating luxuries. If we wanted to say that we all have, maybe we all have a duty to care for the sick or, or make sure there's enough food and medical care for everyone, those kind of things are duties. If we held everyone to an equal duty to contribute to the things that we actually need doing, that contribution would be a really small part of our lives. Instead, we want the least advantaged people to work full time for a boss who is a much more privileged person in order to get them to in order to get them to uh, in order to get them to prove that they deserve to be on this planet that is uh, that is a, a really terrible and unfair system and so I think the critical are the most critical argument against UBI that is somehow unfair and privileges the basic income recipient is far from true. They are not living something for nothing. What they're living on is the compensation for the fact that they no longer have access to direct resources to use the way they want. They can't hunt, gather, fish, farm, start their own business, start their own cooperatives because all the resources are owned by someone else. If you're gonna take resources and own them and deny them to someone else, you owe them compensation. That's what basic income is in the response to these things. And these ideas, of course, have been debated in many ways and different ways. Now, there is, of course, one other common controversy or common, uh, common argument against basic income that it costs too much. Well, I'll, I'll address that in part two. That one has come and gone for many years as well. Uh, now, the last thing I want to talk about in this stage of it is the current research topics in basic income then that's it's really not much to say because the current research topics in basic income is really pretty much everything. Any aspect of basic income is being debated in the halls of academia today. I, I, I read an article a couple of years ago about the effect of basic income would have on dental health. This is actually a published article in an academic journal. This is how far off our, how far of the many issues we're getting. A basic income is insurance policy. How is it, uh, how does it compare to insurance policies? Basic income and, and physical health, basic income and mental health are, uh, are um, focuses of research. Um, 
looking into cost is an important area of research that a lot of people are looking into right now. And also one of the big things that's going on around the world is basic income experiments or experiments with policies that are very much like basic income. There was a very famous one in Finland that included a couple, concluded a couple of years ago. Uh, the United States has several projects going on at the same time. The Netherlands has projects that are similar to basic income. Scotland is hopefully going to be starting one soon. There's a massive one going on in Kenya right now, run by a U.S. charity. And there's, there's many others going around the world. These, ten, these experiments all tend to be very small experiments, except for this one really big, massive one in, uh, in, in, in uh, Kenya. And there was a fairly sizable one in Finland. But these, even these small experiments are, are making, you put them together and they're making a major impact of keeping basic income in the news. As the findings come out, the findings come out, the findings come out, they're keeping basic income in the news. Problem with these experiments is they can test some things and not other things. And the things that they test, they don't always test as well as we would like them to. And the things that they test are not always important as some of the things that they can't test. So while they have good effects, they have bad effects, often are distracting attention of these other issues that we have to use other methods to research on. And I think that's mostly where we're at right now. I haven't keep track of the time, so I'll, I'll end my first round right here. Uh, thank you, dear Carl. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we can continue with dear Alexander. Dear Alexander, please unmute yourself. Oh, okay, you are already unmuted. Please, word is yours. Yes, thank you, Ali. I will start with the movement. The movement, so not the ideas, the movement. The movement is about 100 years old. It started in the country where Annie Miller is very familiar in the United Kingdom. There, in 1920, so 100 years ago, you had an organization called State Bonus League. They argued that everybody should have a state bonus, which is basically a basic income. And that 20% of the wealth of the nation should be used to fund that basic income. And it's remarkable because we're still at the same level. 20% of the gross national product of a country is enough to get a good basic income for everybody. Of course, there was a political action group and they even managed to discuss it on the Congress of Labor, the Labor Party in 1920. They discussed it and the Labor Party said no, but that was the beginning of the real movement. Then we are going to the 30s and I will show you now something from 1933. Here you see a picture from 1933. I will hold it up a little bit longer. Basis income, which means basic income, but written in the old way. And there you see a Dutch guy, Jan Tinbergen, giving a speech defending basic income, economic grounds, on economic grounds. Jan Tinbergen later won the Nobel Prize for Economy and was a very leading social democrat. So it was interesting that already then there was a movement in Holland for basic income, although it was Tiny. At the same time, another country, basically the same year, the country Carl knows very well, United States, you had a movement called Share the Wells. It was a real movement organization and, and, and getting people motivated. And um, he was governor in the South and he wanted to become president of the United States. Here but, we unfortunately, are. but unfortunately, he was murdered before he could stand as a candidate. Well, that happens more often. But the interesting thing is that you have a movement. And then, of course, we have the Second World War, and we get the whole buildup of the new welfare states in all Western Europe, and it takes 30, 40 years to build them up. And then we go fast forward to 1980s. The 1980s, we had an enormous discussion in Holland about basic income. And it was remarkable because it was even a government organization saying we should adopt half a basic income. And it had a role in the, in the government formation in 1994. But in the 80s, there were a group of young men. You see he, me here 36 years ago now, what is it, 35 years ago. 
That was the people who started Basic Income European Network. Well, it was basically the work of Philip van Parijs, who got money because he won a prize and he organized a meeting in Louvain La Love in Belgium. There were 50 academic people. And Philip had the brilliant idea to say, let's do this more often. Let's have a Congress every two years with academic people in a different country in Europe. So we had one in Antwerp and then two later in, and in London, Amsterdam, and in, and in Geneva, in Barcelona. And only in 2006, it was in South Africa, I was not there myself, but in South Africa, it was the first time that the movement went out of Europe. South Africa is of course, the other part of the world. I was not there, but guys saying they had a discussion with Mandela and this is, this is a minister of finance and Mandela was very much for basic income, but his finance minister said no. So you see the movement was already there, influential. But I have to say at that time, it was still based well. 80, 2006, it started to become more activist as well, not only academic people. So you see basically around 2010, 2015, more and more people coming in who are activists, not only academic, but simply activist people who want a basic income. And I think that is because the spell of neoliberalism, of the idea of Margaret Thatcher and of Ronald Reagan, that the market is everything and and the government is nothing and the trade unions should be crushed. That idea, which took a hold of Western society for 40 years is now slowly evaporating. You had the economic crisis 2008, the government has to bail out all the banks and, 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 and other big institutions. So the, the trust in, in the idea that the market is everything is gone. And of course, now we have the pandemic where again, the governments are saving corporations and they're saving uh, people to survive. So the idea is now much more accepted also in the high circles of political elites and, 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 and Washington consensus is gone. The idea is, well, the government should have a bigger role. So there is now more, uh, on the one hand, there is the crisis, which leads to more economic, to more activism at the same time. Uh, there is more willingness to think about it. Um, and then you see, are we related with the women's movement? Well, it's interesting to see that in the 80s, the women's movement was very much against the basic income. And recently that has changed. A lot of feminists are now much more pro basic income than they used to be in the 80s and the 90s. That's very interesting to, to see and to be aware of. The green movement, they are traditionally very much in favor of the basic income. I did research of all the green parties in Western Europe and except for the Austrian parties, all the green parties advocate the basic income. Uh, human rights movement, well, basic income is a human right. That's how you can defend it. So there's a clear connection there as well. The degrowth movement, which is a part of the environment movement, which says we should concentrate on essential things in life and say goodbye to gross, gross, gross. They discuss basic income a lot. And in Germany, they had common conferences between the basic income movement and the degrowth movement. And then you have the trade union movement. That is more difficult. We have a lot of individual trade unionists who are in favor, but the organizations that such the trade unionists are most of the time against. Sometimes there is a small trade union in favor, Annie Miller will remember that there were some trade unions from Holland represented uh, 36 years ago by Geetje Lubby, but they were a minority inside the, the trade union movement. The trade union movement is still very much like everything has to come from, from paid labor and the old system. At the same time, the trade union movement is now so much weaker than 40 years ago. For instance, in my country, you had 35% of the people who are organized by a trade union. Now it's only 10%. And 
and young people only five percent become a member of the trade union. So the this, the, 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 the the influence of the trade union is going down, and that means there is more chance for the UBI activists to become successful. That will be my first contribution. Uh, thank you very much, dear Alexander. Uh, so we heard the contributions of our guests during the first round. Uh, I checked the chat box. There is only one question I get from Professor Artuna. Carl already answered it, but maybe Carl, we better uh, answer here too. The question of Professor Artuna is the objectives of UBI or the objective of UBI. Is it uh, only the elimination of poverty or something more than it? And my response was, uh, was well, the, the objective is different things to different people. For me, I want more than the elimination of poverty, but I'll start with what I can get. Uh, a poverty level UBI would be a lot better than what we have now. Okay. Uh, there, is a, there is a long comment from Refik Kutlar. Uh, uh, is it a question or is it a comment? I guess it's a comment. What, what we can do is maybe we can continue with the second round and... Uh... No, 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 don't change the, don't change the plan. I don't do We said we answered the written questions now and let's follow suit. It's not a question. Well, then read this and read the comment. Okay, let me well, read. Well, maybe I can say something because I see it differently. For instance, in Holland, we have a very high social minimum. We have the highest social minimum all of Europe, maybe even in the, in the world. Still, we're very much fighting for a basic income. That has only partly to do with poverty. The important thing is free people will lose what they want to do in their lives. And they should be able to say no against bad work. Of course, that's an element of poverty. But they should also be able to choose what they want to do, to study or to learn or to form a family and take care of the children or, or their old and sick uh, relatives. And it should be up to them and not to the state to decide how they use their own time. That is the more, at least in Holland, the argument which we're able to reach over the left-right divide. We're able to also get a lot of people on the right wing saying, yes, that's a good idea. We're, we want to fight that for that as well. Uh, there is there's another question in the um, in the chat. I can answer that one if you'd like. Please, yes. Okay. This uh, this this uh, you know I said some of the common arguments about basic income, and this one is 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 actually is is uh, another common argument to address. It says uh, in order to eliminate poverty, I'm in favor of providing each individual a work, any kind of work, even unnecessary ones, and paying every one of them at least a basic income. Human being is still an unmatured creature, generally too lazy to work, needing a motivation. This is one of the reasons of the collapse of communism. And competition is a good tool to provide this motivation. If you pay a basic income to everyone, you won't be able to find any people to work at some jobs. Well, actually, um, this, uh, the communism did not have a basic income. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one of the reasons for uh, the collapse of the Soviet communism was they, they wanted every, they didn't want any, they wanted to eliminate poverty by giving everyone a job, but in order to, in order to try to eliminate poverty by giving everyone a job, you can't really fire people because then those people are gonna be in poverty. Um, and, and actually, so you've got two choices. You can give everybody a fake job, or you can threaten people with poverty who don't work. And then there's always somebody who tests you. And that means that you're not eliminating poverty. You are accepting, not only accepting the existence of poverty, but you're using it as a tool to get the least privileged people to do what you want them to do. And I don't think decision makers are ever good enough decision makers that they can decide what the poor should do. And in, in the Soviet Union, they did a little bit of both. They threatened people a lot, but also they had a lot of jobs that was hard to get fired from. And there was an old saying in the Soviet Union was they, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. And that's what you get when you get 
a fake job like you have in the Soviet Union, what you're trying to talk about here. Now, people do need motivation for work. And that motivation is called good jobs and good pay. And we've got pl- and luxuries. Uh, luxuries make great incentives, but necessities are for everyone. Necessities are things that people could make on their own if society would get out of their way. But society's in their way and saying, oh, all that property belongs to rich people. And you can't have it unless you do what the rich people say. Uh, well, that is using, that is threatening people, like creating a situation that's really bad for them and threatening that to get what you want them to do. When instead, you could have people have a basic income or have direct access to resources. Everybody had a farm, you know, that would be, a, uh, you know, that, you could do it that way, but that would be a lot more expensive. Uh, I don't think you'd have enough land to do that from everybody in Istanbul. But if you did it that way, if you did it that way, then people who offer jobs would have to pay good wages. There's plenty of room. And that means when people don't work, that's always a conflict between, between somebody who doesn't want to work for the money and somebody who doesn't want to pay the money and give the working conditions to get somebody else to work. If, you, if the job is supermodel, everybody works. Everybody will take that job if you're getting paid millions of dollars just to get your picture taken. Uh, so it's always a conflict. And when you say, I'm going to starve, threaten these people with poverty, homelessness, and starvation if they don't work, you're siding in a conflict about wages and working conditions with the privileged people, against the unprivileged people. And look, and look at what happens. He says, now, if you pay basic income to work, you won't be able to find people to work some jobs, exclamation point some jobs well uh you wouldn't have to find you wouldn't have to threaten somebody with starvation to get them to do my job i've got a really good job uh very few people would turn this down for basic income i'm making several times and many times what a basic income recipient is like to get Uh, i'm not going to turn that down so what you're trying to do is to get people you want to put the people who you're giving bad jobs to to do these jobs Well, instead, make it so these jobs aren't so bad. Give them better wages, better working conditions. And maybe think, well, if if, if we need wages so low that people don't want to work, maybe we really don't need this job done. We really need a job done. We will pay enough in, in over and above the basic income to get people to do those jobs. That's what I think is wrong with this argument. Okay, Refik. Carl, Refik is the person that you replied, uh, you commented on his comment. Maybe mm-hmm. he would like to add a few more things. Refik, do you have anything else to add? Well, I can I can say uh, add two more things, actually. In order to uh, have enough sources to pay everyone a basic income, uh, you need to print money and that will create inflation which means you need to print more money if you you never will have enough sources to pay everybody a basic income and on the other hand in order to have all those bad jobs to be done you need to create robots in this case otherwise those jobs will be never done and this is not good for the society. Thank you. Well, the, for the first one, I could just say, well, why don't you do those jobs rather than forcing someone else to do them? Why don't we take, why don't we take all our CEOs and say, you do the really bad jobs? Um, all the privileged people, all the wealthy people say, you do those horrible jobs. Um, and then you can go off and be wealthy. But first you pay your responsibility to society for your own stuff. The second one, the other one is about uh, inflation is, uh, is related to the cost thing that I'm doing in the second part of this. So I'll, that question will be answered there. Okay. Ali Mutlu, devam etler misin lütfen? But uh, may I add two words about this discussion? Tabii ne demek? Of course, you don't need to ask him. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, it is leading to the emancipation of individuals. It's very important. I mean, the ability to have uh, the power to say no is very important to be emancipated. And it also serves for the uh, serves for the bargaining power of individuals. 
so they can uh, have this power. And lastly, it leads uh, to a life in uh, dignity, which is, uh, I think, uh, one of the major issues. Okay, let's continue with the second round. Uh, dear Carl, uh, we can continue with the second round. Would you please continue? Great, all right. So um, this, this idea that, uh, that basic income costs too much or that basic income is uh, unsustainable in the cost or it's gonna cause inflation. And uh, this is uh, simply not true and based on really a misconception about how much basic income costs. Um, all government spending creates inflationary pressure. It, there's nothing special about basic income. If you wanna build aircraft carriers, you create inflationary pressure. If you wanna build roads, you create inflationary pressure. If you want old age pensions, it creates inflationary pressure. More spending, more getting people to purchase things out there creates inflationary pressure. And we have something to counteract that. It's called taxes. Every time you, every time you tax money out of the private sector, out of the private sector, you're creating deflationary pressure. And it's the job of a good, sound fiscal and monetary policy to balance the inflation, the inflationary and deflationary pressures that are coming out. Now, there are also deflationary, there are other de inflation and deflationary pressures that are coming from the economy itself. The government has the tools to counteract that. When governments, that's one thing governments have been getting better at, is, is uh, they're much better at controlling inflation than they, than they than they were 50 years ago or 100 years ago. They know more about how it works uh, and how to do it. And balancing those pressures is not a different thing. So when you have basic income, you're putting a lot more money out there. Well, you got to tax some of that money back. Get that you got that inflationary pressure coming out, a deflationary pressure coming in. Uh, and so as long as the basic income costs a sustainable amount, you can counteract what just like with any other policy. You can counteract the inflationary pressure that it contributes to society with taxes. So we're looking at how to do that. Uh, and I did that. I, stud I did studies on that in the United States and in the United Kingdom, where I, uh, where I used estimates of how much it was going to cost to have people. So I looked at a roughly poverty level UBI of $12,000 for an adult and $6,000 for a child in the United States, and a 50% marginal tax rate. That means for every income you earn privately, you're gonna pay 50 cents in, you're gonna pay 50 cents in taxes, which we've had marginal tax rates much higher than that and had good, uh, good economies uh, despite them. So that's uh, certainly a reasonable marginal tax rate. Um, and uh, people often make the mistake of just think, well, think about how much does UBI cost? They say, well, you multiply the UBI by the number of people, they would think. That seems like the right thing to do, but that is, and, and then you get a very high figure, well into the trillions if you do it this way. But the problem with that is that it doesn't take into account that almost everyone both pays a basic income and receives, sorry, both pays taxes towards the basic income and receives the basic income back. Now, that means you're paying some of your own basic income. Well, you gotta ask yourself, how much does it cost to pay yourself money? Well, nothing. I mean, the government says, the government says, oh, we added a dollar to your bank account for in basic income. We took a dollar out of your basic, uh, out of your basic income, your, your account because of basic income. They added one, they took one. That doesn't affect you any way, shape, or form. So this most of the cost of basic income is people saying paying themselves. In this, in this uh, paper, I estimated that for every dollar that one person pays another person, there are six dollars where people are paying themselves. Whether it's a net recipient who's so some of us are paying less in taxes than we get in basic income. Those are your, your net beneficiaries. The net beneficiaries, they're still paying part of their own basic income. Then you get other people who are net contributors. They pay more in taxes than they receive in basic income. And when, when you look at the cost, the, the, 
real cost of basic income is how much do the net contributors have to give up to provide what benefit for the net, for the net beneficiaries. That's the cost of basic income. What we wanna raise the income of net beneficiaries, how much do we have to lower the income of, of uh, net contributors in order to do this? That's what I calculate in this paper. Look at how much would a person, how many people are getting this level of income? How many people are in that group? How much is their basic income gonna be? What's their tax level gonna be given these assumptions, 12,000 for adults, 6,000 for kids and 50% marginal tax rate. How are people in this, how much are people in this bracket gonna pay? How many people, and receive? How much people in this bracket? And calculate then the total net benefit of this and then therefore calculate the total net cost for the other people you know, minus the transaction costs, which are likely to be very low, similar to Social Security, which has a, a uh, in the United States, which has a, an overhead cost of one or one and a half percent. Now, so using this method, of figuring out how much people in each bracket are going to be receiving and paying, found that uh, the cost of a poverty line basic income, a basic income large enough to eliminate poverty in the United States, is $539 billion per year. That is only 25% of current US entitlement spending. So things we're spending on food stamps and social security and disability insurance and, all, and housing assistance, all of these other things. You add those up, that's four times what we're paying for basic income. Now I'm not calculating which of these we might replace with basic income, but even even just to add basic income without canceling a thing would only increase our entitlement spending by 25%. That's also less than 15% of overall federal spending. It is really ridiculous to think that 15% of overall government spending increase is going to cause rampant inflation, especially when you can simply take that money back in taxes. And that is about 2.95% of GDP less than we spent on the war on terrorism, which didn't cause any inflation and was a really bad idea. Imagine if we use all that money instead of having a so-called war on terrorism going around killing people, uh, a bunch of countries around the world, we just use that to eliminate poverty in our own country. Uh, now, uh, similar countries, countries with a GDP the size of the US uh, will have, uh, will, be able to expect that they're going to have similar costs for a similar program uh, in relation to that. Uh, now, uh, more equal nations and wealthier nations can expect lower costs uh, for the same kind of EBI, and less equal and less wealthy nations can expect higher cost, higher costs to get to the same level. However, uh, those nations often uh, on the, the poorest nations of the world that are often have a lot of poverty in them, also usually have a lot of inequality, and money goes a long way for the poor. So even in those countries, you probably, although you'll have a higher net cost, um, for a given, a given amount of redistribution, uh, you have a, a large tax base to take it from, from the very wealthy. And you also have then uh, a lot of people who will benefit enormously from a basic income, even if it's much smaller than what you have to give in the United States before people will benefit. Uh, now, the net financial benefit um, to most households, uh, the net, uh, sorry, um, net recipients in the United States of this program interest is gonna be most households with incomes below $55,000. So most people with income up to $55,000 are gonna be better off with this financially. And everybody else will be worse off financially, but hopefully better off or live from living in a more equal society and other things. Now, this 55, these people, now the fact that so many people with incomes up to 55,000 are benefiting this means that basic income is effectively not just for those who are without income, but it's, a, it's also a wage subsidy for everybody whose income is between zero and 55,000. So that's going to do a long. It's going to do a lot to help the working poor. Not only is it going to give them leverage to command higher private wages, but it's also going to subsidize what wages they get. 
So we can expect this program to be a very good program for workers. Really the worst thing you can do for workers is to put them in a position where uh, they have no other choice but to work for whoever the boss is. Somehow people like to say uh, UBI is uh, uh, against workers. The very opposite is true. Uh, a labor requirement is against workers. Um, now the average net benefit, the average net beneficiary of this, you know, a weighted average of the different recipients and how much they're getting is a household of about two people making about $27,000 a year privately and then getting a net benefit of nearly $9,000 raising their total income to $36,000. Well, raising somebody's income from 27 to $36,000 a year makes a big impact on that family and their children and will affect their children for their life. Um, uh, this UBI would drop the official poverty rate, poverty rate in the United States from 13.5%, pretty high, to zero. Uh, it will eliminate poverty for 41.3 million people, including 14.5 million children, who are the collateral damage when we want to when we want to punish adults. We always end up punishing their children. You, uh, you, yeah, yo, the adult didn't do what the privileged people want them to do. We're going to take from the adult. You're going to take from that kid, or you're going to take that kid away from the adult. Either way, is a very cruel thing to do that kid. Make them live in poverty, or make them live without their parents. So, uh, the so the net cost of this UBI is uh, less than one sixth of its often mentioned but not very meaningful gross cost of 3.4 trillion. Um, and uh, 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 I also did a little bit of research showing that a, a, a larger one, a larger UBI of $20,000 per adult and 10,000 per child would cost more than three times more. It costs $1.8 trillion. So you're not even doubling it in size, but you're more than tripling, you're more than tripling the cost because of this net cost issue, whereas where you're having more net, net recipients, and when you actually take into account what net recipients really pay, you find out net recipients are getting a, getting a lot more, and that leaves, uh, that leaves 1.8 trillion that's gotta be raised by taxing other people. Still, I think that's affordable. That's 32% of, of its gross cost, one third of its gross cost instead of one sixth. Um, it's about 85% of current and title expense, entitlement spending, but, uh, you could replace some of that title expense, uh, that entitlement spending, get some of this money back. Uh, it's 49% of total federal spending. Well, there are a lot of countries in the world that spend more than 50% more than the United States does in their budget. Uh, and the, and, and uh, the United States could stand to lose some other things in its budget, say, say like 90% of its military spending. That could go over a long way for paying for this. Um, and it is less than 10% of GDP. For less than 10% of GDP, you can get a country where no child, no adult has to fear poverty or coming close to it. When you look at the real cost and contribution of UBI to society, it's a bargain. Thank you, dear Carl. Uh, there are some interesting questions in the chat box, but maybe after Alexander. Dear Alexander? Would you like to continue in the second round? Yeah, thank you, Ali. Um, I'm now 30, well, no, 40 years active in the movement. <clears throat> and the most difficult question I get nowadays is why is basic income not yet interest if it's such a wonderful idea? And I think it's a very good question. Why do we, don't we have already basic income somewhere in the world? Well, the trade unions are against the politicians in my country, the political elite, are now acknowledging that the cost and inflation is not a problem for basic income. The last resort is to say, yeah, but too few people will do the jobs. We get more than 8% voluntary unemployment. That is too high. So they get all kinds of excuses not to do it. But just let's be optimistic. Just this week, what is happening? I was following the discussions in Switzerland. There they collected 91,000 signatures in order that all the Swiss people will get half a year of basic income. 
and they need 100,000 before they go to the ballot box and all the people in Switzerland can express themselves. So that is, that is good. In Germany, they're looking for people who want to participate in a very big basic income experiment. Thousands and thousands of people all over Germany will get a basic income. The money is already there and they're now asking for people to volunteer and join. Um, Austria, just a recent poll, 40% in favor, 40% against. Canada, just last week, there was the conference of the leading party of Mr. Trudeau, the Liberal Party, and they're in the power now already for six years, I think. And the rank and file member said, look, Mr. Trudeau, you're doing well, but you should go forward with a basic income. And he is trying not to do it, but with pressure also because the Social Democrats are in, fa are in favor in Canada and the Green Party as well. In Scotland, but maybe Annie should tell more about it. They just had a recent debate of the five party leaders, I think two days ago or yesterday. And two out of three, basically three out of five came out in favor of basic income. Basically four of the five parties in Scotland are in favor of some kind of basic income. Only the conservatives are against. But the problem is to really introduce it, you have to say they have to be either independent or London has to say, yes, go ahead and do it. But there is, there is growing interest and it's on the brink of getting in, introduced. I will go now through five recent elections where basic income played a role. One of them is not so well known. 2019, we were in Hyderabad for the basic income conference and we learned about Sikkim. Sikkim is one of the parts of India. India consists of a lot of different uh, states which form together a federation. And this little state Sikkim in the mountains in the Himalayas, there they have a political party, the Sikkim Democratic Front, and they have been in power for 25 years. And the last five years they said, okay, we will have only ecological farming. And they say, now we will go for a basic income and we will finance by a higher tax on tourists. And they just missed the, 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 the necessary majority with 2,000 votes out of, I don't know, they have 600,000 people there. So it was very narrow. But the guy who was telling the, uh, this story, he was not pessimist. He said, look, we do it next time. And not only in Sikkim, but in the six or seven other mountain states of India. So you can do it also on a regional level if the political will is there. Then we go to Finland. The, the outgoing government has done an experiment with basic income, which raised the interest in basic income worldwide. But then there was a new election and then the Greens and the left-wing party, they won, and they both have basic income in their program. So they brought that forward in the negotiations with the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, who unfortunately refused. But the compromise was that there is now a state committee from all parties in Finland looking into a basic income. So the discussion goes there further as well. And then we had, when was it? We had elections in Ireland, I think it was 2000 last year. The Green Party said, okay, we're willing to go to government, but only if we get an experiment with basic income. And the other parties in Ireland said, okay, we agree to having an experiment in Ireland as the price for the Greens to participate and some ecological things as well, of course. In Belgium, the Greens were lobbying for a basic income for all the young people. They said, why should we start with basic income and giving young people a basic income and free public transport? And they went from 11 to 20 percent. Uh, of course, it took some time in Belgium to form a government. And now the leading guy from the Liberal Party, the right wing party, said, look, I am in favor of basic income. And I install a government commission, committee to look into basic income. So in Belgium, the discussion goes on as well. Um, now I come to my own country, uh, the Netherlands. The last election, 2007, we as Greens said we want a basic income, a big experiment like they're doing in Finland. 
And that idea was accepted by all the other parties participating, including Mr. Mark Rutte, the Prime Minister. But Greece in the end decided not to join the government, so that went away. We just had recent elections, and it's very nice to see that the left-wing liberals, who are in power now, and a small party, a small Christian party, in favor of uh, the trade of a negative tax, which is technically basically the same, and the Greens came out in favor of a basic income. So there is now discussion going on to form a new government. It will not go straight forward for a basic income, but uh, what could happen is, I already told you that the social benefit is one of the highest in Holland, in Holland compared to the rest of Europe, and on, on top of that, people get all kinds of supplements, supplement for health costs, supplement for housing, supplement for the supplement if you have a child. But all the supplements create costs. Not only the lowest, the lowest 10% who are on the door the poverty trap, no, the end of the population is in poverty trap. Which means if they were there, they get if they 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 they, they earn euros more, then they end up only with ten euros extra, or even they end up with nothing. So there is now a big political will to reform the tax system and to reform the supplement system and give people a partial basic income of three hundred euros for everybody. That's not enough to live from, but the positive effects would already start. But of course, that's the government negotiations. I'm not part of the government. I'm not part of the negotiating team. But that is the way who, how it could be introduced in the Netherlands in the form of a partial basic income, because that's easier for the other parties to accept. Thank you. Uh, thank you, dear Alexander. Uh, there are a lot of written questions in the chat box, but uh, should we firstly Request uh, friends to raise their hands if you would, if they would. But like let's to... let's finish the let's finish the written questions first. I think. Yeah, finish. that makes sense. I think. Yes. And then, but yeah. but uh, Ali, people could like you must it could raise their hands, get in line uh, mm -hmm. to ask their questions directly. So I think we should go through the written questions that have already been asked first. Okay. okay, yeah, I have a few I'd like to respond to. Uh, Alexander, how about you too? Yes, fine. Uh, Carl, can, you want to, would, you, would you allow Ali to read the questions first? Because most, some of the participants might not have read the question. Or otherwise, alternatively, you can read the question loud and then answer it, whichever. Yeah, because some of these, uh, yeah, uh, uh, some of these are just comments that we don't need to Read, but I think, yeah, if, if we're going to respond to one, we should read it first and then respond. Uh, Alexander, do you want to go first? No, no, no. Read the question and we respond. Okay. Um, so the first one I, I think is, is, is um, how does UBI relate with basic education rights, basic housing rights, basic health, basic health rights? Uh, it's an important question that, that I don't think either of us addressed, is that basic income can't be all there is to support for people. Some things need to be provided in kind. The, it's certainly education is that we found in, in uh, a country like Finland, where you have everyone goes to, everyone must go to public school, uh, has the best outcomes. And we should all be moving to that kind of model where, where people are well paid. Um, and basic health rights, we find that, that it's better for everyone if we have a national health service that everybody's in, nobody's out. The experience with that around the world is very clear that's better. Now, housing, you can buy housing with a basic income. Basic income can be large enough that you can buy housing. And that's going to be true really in most of most countries. However, um, most countries also have one area or more that's how, where housing is really expensive. So I'm guessing in, in Turkey, that's going to be Istanbul. And in the United States, that's New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and a bunch of other places. Um, and what you find is it's almost impossible to raise the basic income hard enough that people are going to afford to 
to buy housing on the open market? Well, there's two, there's several ways to address that, which is one is what are your housing policies that's causing housing to be so expensive? Change those, but also if you can't change those enough, you can actually provide public housing or you can have some sort of public vouchers that can be used for buying houses, housing on the open market. But you do need something like that. So yes, basic income has to be combined with other programs. Um, okay, um, somebody else says the cost of basic income uh, uh, is much more, uh, the cost of not providing basic income is much more than providing it. I agree, I'm not gonna get into the facts and figures now. Uh, do you wanna take any others, Alexander? Uh, no, I agree on the housing question. It's, it's difficult to make a basic income high enough also for housing. Like yeah. in all of these, 30% of the houses are public houses and you really need a system like that. Yeah. Now, let's see, one here says, uh, I'm listening to a wonderful dream and what a gracious dream. Now, I'm not sure if that is a, is a positive or a negative comment. Is that trying to dismiss this as just a dream? Well, let me tell you something that, uh, that someone once said that, that a reasonable person accepts the world the way it is. An unreasonable person rejects the world the way it is and goes out to change it. Therefore, all progress must be made by unreasonable people. It's the dreamers who change things. And if you look at all the positive reforms we got, all of them were just a dream. The end of slavery was once a dream. Women's suffrage was a dream. Old age pensions was a dream. Public housing was a dream. All of these things were dreamed once and they're not dreams anymore. And the same can be true for basic income if enough of us unreasonable people get behind this thing. Incidentally, Carl, that yeah. question, but I bet knowing her a little bit, but uh, that comment was by Suna, I, sh I bet she meant it negatively. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, you want to take any of the others, or? Okay. Did, did, uh, Alexander, do you have any comments about uh, those words? Well, yeah. Basic income is a nice dream. That was the case in the eighties, but nowadays it's a necessity. We need to reform the welfare state, and uh, and it's happening slowly and surely, because the old system can't go on like that. And it's just a matter of time where one state <clears throat> or a region says, look, we go for basic income, and then the spell is broken. Then you will see a lot of states and a lot of regions following. Yeah. That's the whole thing which to happen. It doesn't mean we start with a full-blown basic income like we dream of, but we start with a partial basic income, or we start with giving the young people a basic income, and that in itself will have miraculous effects and they will be reported and that will unleash such a grave of enthusiasm that the elites and the other parties can't stop it anymore. They have to say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, dear friends. Uh, let me ask another question, but which is not uh, sent to everyone. That's why I have to read it. Uh, there's a question uh, which says, uh, logically, all said is very good. Uh, what is the problem, they say? In fact, you try to answer it, mm -hmm. but why it's not being implemented? I mean, this is the question. What is the problem? Well, it hasn't been implemented because it's, it's an enormous change from what we have, and people fear change, but also there are a lot of interest in it. Is people want to pay low wages to the lower class. You know, we have this question here, what's going to happen to those jobs uh, that was still remains unanswered. Well, it doesn't remain unanswered. It's really easy to solve. If you want people to wash dishes, you don't threaten them. We wash your dishes for them at a restaurant. You don't threaten them with starvation. You, uh, you offer them a good wage or you wash your own damn dishes. Um, and I tell you, if you pay what I may, I work, I, I, I am a university professor. I teach college students, some of the most privileged college students in the world, the children, uh, the, uh, in, in Qatar, well, the, the young adults in Qatar, uh, the wealthy 
oil and gas exporting country. I teach very wealthy children. Because I'm willing to teach wealthy children, I make a lot more than most other professors with my level of experience. And I tell you, if you want me to wash dishes, you pay me the same hourly rate that I'm making right now uh, for teaching these kids, I will happily become a dishwasher. I will probably shorten my hours. You can you <laughs> offer that same rate to somebody else. So what we're doing when we say we want to not have UBI to get people to work, we want them to do our crap work for us. No, oh, let's make the crap work attractive so everybody wants to do it. Thank you, Carl. Uh, I would like to comment about this question, but maybe at the very end. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, do you have uh, any comments about this question or comment? It says, logically, all said is very good. While no, no. OK, let's continue. Uh, there's, a, there's a comment from Professor Artuna. He says, the cost of not providing UBI is much more than providing it. In fact, Carl uh, mentioned about this. I mean, he talked about this. Alexander, do you have any comments regarding this issue? The uh, it's true, but it doesn't convince people. It only convinces people who are already convinced. <laughs> okay. uh, we have to convince people who are doubting. For but instance, we, in Poland, we have now a small majority of people saying yes to a basic income. But, but, a, but, growing minority, but a growing minority says maybe yes, maybe no. For them, but, it depends how high the basic income will be and how it compares to the present situation. Like I told in Holland, you get 1,100 euros for being on the dole, plus housing money, plus energy money, plus part of your health costs. So you're not poor and you're not starvation. And if you don't, if you don't want to work, well, the communes let you sit on your money. So they're uh, not forced to work. Oh, but and they'll have to convince yeah, Alexander, people. I uh, Alexander, I guess uh, the question is, I mean, the comment is cost of not providing UBI to the society. Cost to the society is much more than providing it. I mean, uh, it's not making these calculations uh, as an individual, but to the society, uh, I guess, am I correct, Professor Atuna? Yeah, okay. So the cost of not providing UBI to the society is much more than yeah. providing it. So the problem is, more. it's true, like the health conditions will improve and the mental health will improve <clears throat> if you have a basic income, but it's difficult to put a figure on it. And in political discussions, it's the money question which is decisive. Well, there is, a, but still I think we need to address these issues. Um, uh, there's only one study I know that actually tries to take this into account in, in, a, in a reasonably full sense of all these different savings that we get from having children not growing up in poverty and children doing better in school and all the other things that we get from basic income and the better mental health and so forth. Um, and this is, this is by Richard Perriera, if I'm saying that right. And he has a very good study on this. We need more studies like this. Um, and uh, if the argument, you know, we got to make the argument in all these different ways, even the ways that we don't think will, you know, convince me if, it, if it's a relevant issue, we got to get all that information out. And that's what's great about the amount of basic income uh, research and activism that's going out right now is people are addressing questions that I've always dreamed of addressing and, and never had time. And it's and almost and used to be, oh, that'll never happen, that nobody will research that. Uh, and now it's like almost anything I think of, somebody's out there working on it. And that's, I think that's a great thing about where the movement is now. Uh, thank you, dear Carl. Let's continue. Uh, okay, there's a question from Rafi Kutler. Uh, balancing the income of the whole society by the means of tax and, tax and basic income sounds like a fair solution. But the question of who will do those jobs still remains unanswered. I think we covered this question, did we? Can I consider that we covered? Okay, let's continue with Yilmaz Ayata's question. Uh, Ayata, oh, bir dakika, bir dakika. He raised his hand, so let him speak. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Oh, it's just okay, Yilmaz. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't think you want me to read my uh, question. No, no, ask, you? ask your question. I mean, 
Okay, my question is, are you connected with the activity of the United Nations who have committed themselves, including 193 states, uh, member states, have all committed themselves uh, in a document, a declaration called Transforming Our World. And under this declaration, there are 16 sustainable development goals and either the second or the first or the third, I don't remember now, uh, goal is putting an end to poverty. Uh, now, uh, is your organization familiar with this activity? Are you involved in any part of it? Because after all, all the countries, all the states that are member to the United States, United Nations, have committed themselves to put an end to poverty. So uh, what you are trying to do is part of what they have already committed themselves to do. That's my question. Are you in any way involved in this uh, universal activity? All right. Okay. Yes, Carl, Alexander, would you like to? Yeah, well, it's true. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals are taught in, 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 in schools in Holland. My daughter has to learn about them. The point is that the government in Holland says we have no poverty. So <laughs> we, hmm. we, already, we already fulfill our goal. And the idea of the United Nations is that this is absolute poverty and they want to do something about absolute poverty. So that's basically concentrating on the developing countries and the failed states. At the same time, we have an organization called PIEN, Basic Income Earth Network. They reached out to the people of the United Nations and they have conducted discussions with them, with the UNDP and with others, so that more of the people of the United Nations are involving basic income in their work and seeing that as a perspective to solve poverty. And we slowly get positive responses. But the United Nations is still an organization run by 20, with 100, almost 200 governments. And the majority of the governments, they don't like basic income. And I would just like to add that I think, uh, for reasons I've said before, that uh, this idea of you want to eliminate poverty, but you're against basic income is disingenuous. Because only a universal policy like basic income can eliminate poverty because if it's conditional if it is in any way conditional then there is someone who will not meet those conditions and will live in poverty and you're not only therefore you're not only accepting poverty but you're actually using it you're using poverty as a threat to get people to meet your conditions it's a cruel it's the cruelest way there's so many ways to get people to meet conditions and, and, uh, and making them live in poverty if, until they do what you said is so cruel. So this very idea that they're endorsing this but not endorsing basic income is, is I believe, just uh, fully disingenuous. Uh, Ailey, if you allow me a minute, the, the dream woman, <laughs> Suna, <laughs> was trying to make yes. a comment there. She, she's the one who asked who I thought Whose, whose comment was negative, uh, the, the dream. Was I'm, I'm not negative dream. at all. Okay, Suna. Okay, I'm not negative at all, you understand me. It was a wonderful thing that I had have listened. A wonderful dream. A wishful, great wishful and wonderful, most wonderful, gorgeous dream. Wish it would happen one day. But I doubt very much, unfortunately, because of the, the, the world is deep in capitalism living. Um, it's very difficult to understand the um, Eastern world of mind and European world of mind. I'm not talking anything about the Americans, of course. But for Turks, for us, we can understand very well the Europeans, the Americans, of course, and Asians and Africans as well. 
So what I have been traveled in my whole life in many countries, um, for me, the shortest thing is to say my feelings, it's a wonderful dream. I wish one day it will happen for the future, uh, for the world, for the people in Africa. We have seen the worst, poorest people in Africa, in Ethiopia. No one can imagine. And can you imagine the Americans sent all the garbage there and I, we have shopped, I remember we have seen, they have sent undated, undated, cans of food as well. So if you have seen the cruelty of capitalism, um, you, I can, you can only say it's a dream, but it's a wonderful dream. That's all. Okay. Thank you very Thank much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Ali, buyur lütfen. Uh, uh, dear friends, I would like to say a few things about the sustainable development goal. But there is a question, there's a written question. If, uh, if you must, if you if you want to save your question to the last, there is a written question. Okay, from it's up to you though. It's totally up to you. Okay, uh, there is a written question contribution from Ayhan Bahatusu. Yeah, okay, let me read it. It's by Refik Kutluer. Mm -hmm. If you pay higher wages for jobs like dishwashing, you need to control your borders strictly. Otherwise. High immigration will be your new problem. Well, uh, uh, that really, uh, I think that that also is a real a real non-issue because countries do control their borders, and uh, and of course the ultimate solution we have a worldwide basic income. That's what I'd much rather have. Uh, but uh, uh, countries control not only control their borders; they control who's eligible to work. They control, uh, they, they can punish uh, companies for hiring the wrong people, and they control how long an immigrant has to be in the country before they're allowed to work or to receive things like uh, 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 government benefits such as basic income. It's something that is, with, is, that is within the control of government. It's not really something uh, to worry about, but if, wow, somebody come, wants to come here and do a job, uh, yeah, let them come. I, I mean, the United States, the United States is about the same size as China, and we got a third the population of China. Let the Chinese come. Let the Indians come. Let the Brazilians come. Let all those big countries come, and now we'll be their neighbor. It's a very good question. It happened already 500 years ago, <laughs> when there was one Flemish village giving free bread to their poor people. And then, of course, the poor people from other, country, from other villages walked to get also the free bread so you need to have control it's also discussed in holland nowadays if a foreigner comes to holland you have to wait five years before you can get social employment social unemployment money and of course there's a discussion with the trade union says they say it should be 18 years and the greens say it should be five years so you have to find a political compromise somewhere and then that question is dealt by uh, thank you, dear Alexander. Uh, dear friends, there is a contribution from Ayhan Bahatusus, and then uh, Professor Arjuna wants to ask a question. Maybe I better read the contribution from Ayhan Bahatusus. He says, I think to mention about the financial figures may cause some disturbance and misunderstandings. The figures payable to each and every individual could be calculated when and a real source of funds become available upon a real surplus created by GMP and reasonable taxation applied. This is a matter of distribution. First, we should agree on the subject to support the people, those who may have no chance to earn any income. That was the contribution from Ayhan Bahatusus. Any comments about this, dear Carl, dear Alexander? I think it's a good point. Okay, Alexander? Yeah, yeah, you need you need to have a function state to do it. Yeah, in in, in Ethiopia you can't do it, but uh, in Holland you can do it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, Professor Atena would like to talk. Please unmute yourself. Yes, I have done it. 
Okay, uh, but, but, but not a question. I just wanted to make a comment. Is it all right? All right. Sure, sure. Of course, yes. Okay. And, uh, now, we're thinking, uh, our thinking is related to current world. Now, we're on, the, on a threshold. The world is changing. We'll have to create a new world. Uh, in in that I uh, in that I mean, uh, we know that uh, in the near future, about fifty percent of the current jobs will be eliminated for the human beings. I mean, robots and intelligence machine will be doing that. New needs will arise in the society or in the, in the world and new jobs will be created. And that requires a, well, emancipation from the current conditions in the world, not only poverty, a new world is very developing. It's, and in fact, our problems are increasing and if we keep our current a current system, if we do not develop a new world, working world, or a living world, or uh, let's say a welfare state, uh, the, the other uh, alternative is the world is going to face a, a, a very severe conditions. Now, uh, I, I believe, and I have done. I, I have studied the key case as much as I could, and I have a, a, I have written a book on that. You know, and a, well, uh, Ali knows it very well. I believe that we don't have an option. We have to provide a base universal basic income. Because the people will be de developing new talents, talents that we don't know very well yet. New talents will have to be created in order to solve the new problems arising and in order to create a welfare state all around the world. So, it's not a fantasy. It's an, it's something we have to do. We don't have an option. It's a necessity. That's a comment I wanted to make. Uh, thank you, Professor Atuna. Dear Carl, dear Alexander, would you like to contribute after Professor Atuna's contributions? Uh, well, I would say I, I largely agree with, uh, with what um, Ozer was saying, but I don't know if it's going to become a necessity. But I think it's already this, this uh, relationship between automation and basic income has been true for a long time. Our economy is what they call creative destruction very often, is that uh, new businesses come and, and, and outcompete the old ones. The, the, uh, tractor, uh, the tractor and the automobile unemployed the horse um, and the blacksmith and the wagon wheel maker and the wagon maker. All these industries lost, the people lost their jobs. A new industry started. But if you were a skilled blacksmith in 1910, you were, you were not gonna go to a, a better industry in the, job, in, the, in the automobile industry. You were gonna lose your job and go down to the bottom of the economic ladder. And that is painful for people. We need a basic income to ensure both that the wealthy share the benefits of automation, which they've been doing less and less since we busted the unions and uh, since we busted the unions and gutted the welfare state over the last 50 years, most of us have not shared in the benefits that automation has created in the last 50 years. But also we need it as a cushion for this creative destruction. So when one industry is replaced, the people in there don't suffer too much and they get the opportunity, like he was saying, to build their new skills. So we've had this in place since we replaced the horse industries. Uh, who knows what kind of new skills and new ideas would happen now. Maybe dishwash dishes would also already be washed by uh, robots already. Thank you, Carl. 
Alexander? Yeah, I agree. Plus, I want to add that this changes, this creative destruction is now going faster than in 1910. Mm -hmm. So that adds to the urgency yeah. to make the transition smoother, that more people can make this transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, dear friends, I would like to ask a question, uh, but maybe not only to, all, to, to, to uh, only two of you, but also to any, because any is oh. without you. Yes. I, I would like to remind that people can ask questions in Turkish, and you'll trans you'll translate. Yeah, yeah it's uh, a, of it course. looks like people might be struggling to type something and might want to just ask their questions in Turkish. Okay, my question is: our motivation in 2015. Uh, when we started to work uh, regarding the basic income was in order to have a healthy democracy practice, mm -hmm. the members of the society should have economical independence. Otherwise, uh, the democracy practice is leading to some very poor results. And that was the starting point of us in 2015 and early 2016. And then I, I became a member of PN. And at the moment, I think the biggest obstacle against the implementation of basic income are the politicians. Because first of all, they don't know the concept. Secondly, they would like to de degenerate or denigrate the concept. And, uh, and also they are not happy with the emancipation of the people. So the biggest obstacle, I guess, is uh, if in a country, the separation of power <coughs> is not fully installed, then it's a big problem to have a basic income on the table, I mean, realized. Because uh, if the politicians are both uh, in connection with uh, legislative power and executive power, then uh, at the end of the day, basic income is not only redistribution of money, at the end of the day, it's redistribution of power. So if these powers are not well separated or uh, enough separated, then in these countries, it's quite difficult. So in my view, the biggest obstacle against the implementation of basic income is uh, if the separation of powers is not uh, fully uh, available in this country, then it's a big problem. That, that was my question. And uh, maybe Carl, Alexander, and dear, any if you would like to comment about this question or anything else you would like to say, you are also very welcome. Also, you are one of the founders of the BN from 1986. So we can start like with any, if you agree, dear Carl and Alexander, do you allow me to start with any? Thank you very much, Ali. Um, I, I've noticed that there are a lot of populist um, governments around the world, and this is because people don't trust the establishment, and it's undermining democracy, and the establishment has to take responsibility for this. One of the necessary conditions for our democracy is some minimum level of equality, of power, of income, of wealth, and so on. And governments haven't been doing that. I know that in the UK, the, the governments we've had for the last four decades have avoided very studiously uh, from uh, redistributing income and wealth and our inequality levels have been increasing. So there's a lot to do there and the basic income will help a lot and help to um, bring about the democracy that is so necessary for the better functioning of society. Uh, can I say something about the work incentive or do you want please, to Please, please, yes. I mean, please. Right. Um, this is because of my economics background. There just is no evidence at all that a basic income is going to lead to enormous reduction in work effort. The, all the evidence shows that people want to work because not just for the earnings, but because of the social and health advantages that they get from it. And so uh, even if they can't get paid work, they will try to find ways of grouping together and they will contribute to the social economy, doing things unpaid, but are good for the community. Now, I've been retired for some time and my pension is my basic income and I work about six hours a day at least on uh, doing things for basic income, writing papers or communicating with people. So uh, let me be an example of how people do like to work. They like to contribute. And I don't think people need worry that there's going to be a mass exodus from the labour market. The problem is not 
people not wanting to work, but the problem would be there not being enough jobs. Uh, another small point is that a few years ago, we suddenly had a national minimum wage and people predicted that people, it would stop people working. But in fact, more people wanted to work, even part time. And that's because there's a concept in economics called the reservation wage. If the wage rate is too low, uh, then people are not, uh, and you're below the reservation work, wage it means that it's too low to make it worthwhile to your work that you're not going to earn enough from the time available to make it worth your while so raising wage levels and in, in fact the basic income can do this too can make give opportunities for poor people low wage people to actually get into the labor market so it could lead to redistribution of work from um from unpaid to paid and vice versa um, I, have no, I have no fears about that at all. Dear Annie, thank you very much. Maybe before, uh, I mean, maybe you can also comment about the coming elections in Scotland, 6th of oh, May, oh. <laughs> very shortly, please. Um, we, we have five five parties, uh, well, and the, recently a sixth party have uh, are going to be contesting the elections. And uh, the major party, the Scottish National Party, is likely to get a majority of seats. The Scotland has not voted for a Tory government for decades. It voted to stay in the European Union. When we had a referendum for independence in 2014, the unionists told us if we vote no against uh, independence, it would ensure we could stay in the EU. And look what happened. We've been betrayed. So now we need another referendum. And I hope that if we do get uh, uh, independence, then we will be able to have the sort of society that the people in Scotland want for themselves, not the one imposed from Westminster by, uh, well, I won't describe what I think of the Tory government in Westminster, but it's not very complimentary. So <laughs> uh, roll on the election. I can't wait for it. It's going to be very exciting. So. And the SNP and the Green Party are very much in favour of a basic income. And I think the Liberal Democrats have said so too. Um, so there's a lot of optimism now. Uh, good things could happen. So. Thank you very much, Dean. And I heard that, I read that uh, the National Scottish Party is wishing to have UBI as a backbone during the uh, referendum too. Yes. Thank you yes. very much. Dear Carl, dear Alexander, what do you think about the biggest obstacle against the implementation of UBI? Um, I want to talk about something, something else that that uh, you and Annie just said about basic income being about power and how important that particular power is to democracy. And I want to come in on your side because uh, of what what democracy requires to truly work is that everyone has some power. And basic income would concede to the least advantage a different kind of power and a more substantial power than they have. But we, 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 to the least advantaged people, they have the right to vote. They have the, they have the right to use their voice. And to some extent, they still have the right to form unions. All of those things that are, are useful if a bunch of people do it. If a lot of low-income people vote the same way, that has an impact. If a lot of them form a new union, they have an impact. If a lot of them use their voice for one way or another, that has an impact. But if one of them says it, if one of them tries to start a union, or one of them votes one way and nobody else does, that power really doesn't get them much of anything. But basic income gives them a power that they can use individually to give them great control over their lives. That's why Katja Kipping said, the old left wanted to control the means of production. The new left wants to control their own lives. And that's what basic income is about. It is really the ultimate form of the sharing of power. It is, it is where we're not gonna have such an incredible power imbalance between the privileged and the disadvantaged. That's probably the most important thing basic income does. Thank you, dear Carl. Did Alexander, any comments regarding the separation, separation of powers and basic income implementation? Well, you asked the obstacles. Well, the obstacles is that people should be aware of the basic income. 
I started by asking how many people in Turkey in the streets are aware. Well, not enough. But in Holland and in Scotland, after 30 years of discussion, people are aware and they know what the basic income is. And that gives pressure on the political parties to adopt a point of view. And there you see that once a party adopts a basic income, they normally don't go back on it because it's a vote of winner. They win votes with it. They do not lose votes. It's sometimes even spectacular. And that will turn to a moment that one country or one region will say, yes, we will go ahead. And you saw already with the June referendum in Switzerland that gave worldwide attention to the idea of basic income. And then we had the experiment in Finland that gave worldwide attention to basic income. And when one country or one region says, yes, we go for it, then it will simply happen. Thank you, dear Alexander. Dear friends, there's a question in the chat box uh, from David Mazayata. Uh, he's asking about the Swiss, uh, the friend about Switzerland. Did the Swiss vote against basic income recently? No, it was not recently, it was 2016. Mm -hmm. 16? I thought it was 2015. No, Maybe. no, it was the first, first of June 2016, okay. uh, just before we went to Seoul in South Korea. And 25% said yes, and 75% said no. So they were halfway of the 50%. It was more than they have expected. And now people are collecting signatures. You need to go to your city hall and put your signature there. And if 100,000 people do that in Switzerland, then that question will be put forward to all the members of the Swiss society, all the adults will vote. Now there is a, the question is a temporary basic income for six months for all the people in Switzerland, basically to counteract the effects of the pandemic. And they have now 91,000 signatures and they need only 9,000 more and they will get the 100,000. So then they will vote on a temporary basic income. And I should say the national ballots that they have in Switzerland uh, uh, are usually something that has to be done several times to build up an idea. No initiative has passed on its first time in Switzerland. So this is, uh, it, it, it's, it's one thing you do to get people to start thinking about this. And, and uh, Alexander has it exactly right. They got halfway to where they need to be and they've just been building the movement from there. Okay, Ali, let's ask the participants if they have any questions, encourage them to raise their hands or ask a question. Or they can even wave across the screen if they have a is there any comment or question, anybody from the audience or participants that they like to ask? Ayşe Gezdur, sen, are you behind your uh, photograph? Ilhami, did you raise your hand? No, okay. Okay. No one, okay, fine. Uh, so there is no more questions. Let's finish off then. May I have one last question? Please, please. Okay. Uh, dear Alexander, dear Carl, and dear Eni, uh, very nice to see you here, uh, senior UBI advocates. What kind of advice do you give for us while advocating UBI in Turkey? By the way, we don't call UBI in Turkey, we call citizens basic income because universal, the term universal, uh, people are confusing it with global. And they, they think that it's a kind of uh, project created by imperial powers, United Nations, something else. No, no, no. If you call it Evrensel, I think that will be that nobody would misunderstand. You don't, universal no. is not a Turkish name in the first place. It's not a Turkish world. You should call it Evrensia. You translate this. Never mind. Never mind. Okay, oh, we, go on. It's Evrensia. Uh, people think it's Curacao or Gulenbay. Okay, thank you. Tamam. Okay, okay. Okay, what are your advices, dear friends? Carl, Alexander, any? Um, I can give you advice on, on research and getting your theoretical, uh, theoretical arguments together. 
But when it comes to activism, uh, I'm the one who should be taking advice for you. I applaud the amount that you've done in the last few years building up the, the UBI movement from zero in Turkey. I remember when it was basically zero in Turkey and what you've done is good. Um, so you know, on this issue, you should be the one, you should be the ones giving advice. Uh, Alexander and Annie probably know more about activism than I do. Very kind of you, Carl. Thank you. Uh, I think my advice is you don't need an experiment. If you have an experiment, it's going to take several years before you get the result. And there are enough experiments around the world so that we have a good idea about what the effects of, um, of a basic income are going to be. So the advice is encourage your parliaments, your, your politicians to start off with a small one uh, for, for the whole country and let's see what good effect it has. And then it will start creating a momentum for it to be increased until it gets up to a sufficient level to prevent poverty, uh, which is, or I would say create well-being. It's not just about um, not, uh, not having material deprivation, but it's about not having financial insecurity or stigmatization or exclusion. It's about being in good health, good mental health, good have, having good ed educational opportunities, which a basic income will help to increase. And it's about creating community, not dividing a country, but creating community, a just, inclusive and united society. And it's about people having choices in their life, about having agency, about having financial autonomy, about having um, uh, being emancipated, having choice over the use of their own time. It's it's not extreme uh, liberty, but it's it's a personal liberty about what you do with your with your time and how you contribute to society. And with that emphasis that it's about for everybody, not just for one's personal good, I think that you could get people to back it and see what good effect it will have. Thank you, thank you, Dirani. And lastly from Alexander. Well, I would say make a summary in Turkish of the 10 most important experiments that have been held. And every experiment you can learn something and that summary you should discuss in small circles. So you're based in Istanbul, but you have other people based in other parts of Turkey to get the idea going. So you need small groups all over the country discussing basic income. That's, that's because you said most people don't know. Well, start with the people who know and spread with them among themselves. And of course, then you need also social media nowadays. Young people, are they don't read books, but they're on social media and you can reach them there. So you, every day you should post something new on your social media. And that's possible because there is so much happening around the world. That's what I do in Holland too. And then slowly you get the big, uh, bigger gathering of people who are into it. And then you should every year organizing something for all those activists to do together. Mm. I, I would li I would like to, I wish to add something uh, and supporting from moving on from what uh, I, Annie said, instead of experimenting this in the country, maybe you could organize a group of people whose support you're seeking and take them to a country where a poor, poor country, uh, where there's been experience, that there was a successful experience, and let them see it for about a week or so. These are the people who support your willing to, or your, your wishing to see, who, who you wish to be supported by. Just take them there for a week. Let yeah. them see. That's a great idea. Yeah. If you took the same amount of money we could spend to have an experiment exactly. and just flew key people down to Kenya and exactly. have them see the results of the Give Directly experiment. Exactly. Uh, that would be cheaper, really. It's yeah. Cheaper. Oh, yeah. Uh, dear friends, I would like to say something. Uh, in 2018, there was a gentleman in Finland. Uh, he was a part of the experiment and he shared his experiences during the Congress. It was very interesting. Uh, Professor Atuna will remember, I guess. And after Finland uh, in India, 
in 2019. Uh, you know, there was a huge experiment in the past uh, with guys standing and Salat Tawala, a huge number of ladies. They were in the Congress and they um, told about their experiences uh, based on this experimental uh, study. So it was very interesting too. So James' idea is very interesting. Uh, we did in a very limited sense in Finland and in India, but maybe it's a good idea to go to Kenya and to spend one week with maybe with some journalist. <laughs> so yeah. that when they come back, they can write in their corners, I mean, in the newspapers. Yeah. It's an interesting idea. Politician journalist, you know. You... A politician journalist. But in the meantime, there are two questions in the chat box. One is from Ilkay Dir Bodrolu. Ilkay Abi, would you like to? Jay Bilaka, before we go on, let's let this let these two be the last questions. Okay. okay. Then we can uh, because people are leaving and they're sending good night, good evening, thank you messages. I think it's about uh, okay, but let's go on. And then we'll see if it will raise you, but let's not try to stretch it longer than well, the natural. Okay, Mo okay. carry on, please. Last two questions. One is from Ilkay Bodrolu, the other one is from Mark Kaim Akshala. Okay, Ilkay Abi, where did you go? Would it be a good idea to do an experiment in a small city in Turkey, like Gümüşhane or anything like that, Ardahan maybe? Just a limited experiment in a small city. Mm -hmm. Would that make sense? No, it's going to take too long. An experiment takes at least a year to set up. It takes two or three to take place and at least another year to get the results. You need to start sooner than that. We can't wait. The time for experiments has passed. Mm -hmm. Now is the time for action. We and really have to get going and, and to do it. And there have been so many experiments that have found the same results over and over again in yeah, so many different yeah. countries that, yeah. uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of new to add any, anymore, just doing one in Turkey. Don't have an experiment. <laughs> get, get a city to, to organize it for their own people in that city, not just an experiment for a sample, but for everybody to demonstrate that it can work. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, make a summary in Turkish of all the experiments that have been held. That's enough. I would like to say something uh, regarding the experiments. You know, there are two sides of the experiment. One side is distribution of the money. The other side is financing the concept. So uh, the experiments are not really, uh, uh, really uh, a basic income concept because you don't have changes in the taxes. You don't have changes in the custom regulations. You don't have changes in the social policies. And you only is give this money to a certain number of people in the society. So you don't feel the real touch of the basic income in the whole society. So experimental studies give some idea, give some awareness, but they are not really measuring the real positive impact of basic income. So my point is basic income is a political choice, so we cannot experiment it. But anyhow, in the meantime, I mentioned this. So next question and the last question is uh, from... Uh, our dear friend, Omar Kaim Akçalan. Uh, Omar Abi, would you please unmute yourself? Yes, uh, my question is, uh, what is the priority of basic universal income uh, in a country where uh, the main struggle is uh, to establish democracy and uh, to protect democracy? Uh, how, uh, how can... Uh, basic uh, income uh, idea uh, gain uh, importance or is it possible um i think uh i, I think um basic income isn't really a competitor with other progressive goals uh you got to work on all of them you got to be people working for different ones take what you can get you know if you can get some democratic reforms take that if you can get basic income take that there are times when non-democratic governments put good policies in place, uh, uh, at least one or two good things that they do. Uh, so it's not really a competition and uh, just gotta work, gotta work for progressive goals, whatever seems most doable uh, at the time and the place. Uh, and of course, democracy is one of the most important ones to work for there is, but, uh, 
but uh, it's all, it's a, you know, strategic question and a question of, and, and really um, just, just take what you can get. Uh, may I read what I wrote to the chat box? Uh, democracies will and should enable basic income and basic income will be the savior of themselves. Yeah, oh, no. when I say sometimes uh, uh, non-democratic countries enact good policies, I don't mean that that's an excuse to keep them around <laughs> or, or that they're better at that than democracies. Just once in a while, you can get some good thing through. It's not always true that you have to have all the democratic forms you want before you get this other policy. Sometimes you can get, you can convince people to do it. Sometimes you can't. Uh, dear Jam, I guess. Okay, you're you're pa you're li you're passing over the microphone back to me, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe we should stop. No, not necessarily now. We 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 can stop the recording, but never mind. Okay, uh, Ali Mutu, thank you very much for all getting all these people together, the speakers, really. Alexander, to you, uh, Carl, and uh, Annie, to you. You should have been one of the speakers too, but obviously Mehmet doesn't favor you. Uh, Ali doesn't favor you all that much, I do not. <laughs> well, next time you could do a whole thing he on left, Annie's work. He left you <laughs> out of his list, so. It's not like he gave me the list and then the CVs and I picked them up. No, it was he who organized this. <laughs> True to God. <laughs> Honestly, God. Okay. Thank, thanks, everyone, for attending and staying till the end. And we'll see you on Sunday, but this time not at 4 p.m., but at uh, 8.30 in the evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. And Thanks have, for so much for having us. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye. Eddie, it was very nice to see you. Bye. Uh, Bye, Ali. Thank, thank you for the good work. No, with your contributions. Thank you very much. Well thank you. Thank you. Bye. Beautiful. Bye.